As you do know that in our previous lecture, we had almost finished our chapter number seven. So these are the last ratios which we are going to discuss. This is the working capital ratio and working capital ratio is going to be find out by using this formula that is sales revenue divided by working capital. In our exam, you will not be required only to calculate the ratios, but you will be required to interpret them. Okay, so you must be knowing the meanings of these ratios. So over here, when we are dividing sales revenue with the net working capital, we are trying to interpret that how our working capital is helping us to generate revenue, how efficiently and effectively the working capital is used in the organization to generate each and every penny of the revenue. So this is the purpose of calculation. Uh, of this ratio, that is sales revenue divided by net working capital. Now, in our last lecture, we had discussed about the calculation of operating cycle. Do you remember? Yes. So, how do we calculate the cash operating cycle? There is a formula for that. So, cash operating cycle is equal to, how do we calculate it? If we do have receivables, we are going to calculate the receivables collection period. If we do have inventory, we are going to calculate inventory holding period. If we do have different kinds of inventory, say for example, uh, raw material, work in progress and finished goods, together with all those, we are going to calculate the inventory holding period separately. And we are going to add both of these and we are going to deduct payables payment period in order to calculate the cash operating cycle. So this is the formula which we have discussed. Now in this question, we are required to calculate the cash operating cycle. They say Marlboro company estimates the following figures for the coming year. Sales, receivables are being given, gross profit margin is given, finished goods are given, work in progress is there. Raw materials are given, trade payables, inventory levels are constant. Raw materials are 80% of the cost of sales and all are on credit. Now, the thing is, the first thing which we need to uh, you know, concentrate on is that we have given all the three types of the uh, inventory. So we are going to calculate the finished goods holding period, work in progress holding period, and raw material holding period separately. And we are going to add all of those together with the receivables collection period, and we are going to deduct the payables payment period out of that to calculate the cash operating cycle. So one by one, we are going to go for that. Now over here, they have given us the gross profit margin as well. It means that they do not have given us the cost of sales figure. So we do know that sales revenue, sales minus cost of sales is basically our gross profit. So they are giving us the sales figure and they say that the sales are 3,600,000. ,000. But they have not given us the figure for cost of sales. But they say the gross profit margin is 25% on sales. So we do know very, uh, you know, we do have an understandability regarding that, that sales price is equal to cost plus profit. And when we do say that there is a gross profit margin, it means that it is 25% on sales. So sales are 100% here, am I right? So it means that the cost is 75%. So it's 25% on sales. So gross profit does mean this. So 25% and sales price is 100% and cost of sales is obviously 75%. And over here, the sales are given to us, 3,600,000. So what could be the cost of sales then? Very simple, 3,600,000 divided by 100 multiplied by 75. How much will it be? Cost of sales, calculated 3,600,000 divided by 100 multiplied by 75. Multiplied by 75. So 2,700,000 are our cost of sales. So our gross profit would be 900,000. <laughs> Okay, under cost of sales, we do know that we have raw materials and they say uh, that raw materials are 150,000. And they say that raw materials are 80% of cost of sales, which are all on credit. So 80% of this cost of sales are raw materials. How much are these? 2,700,000 
multi-fiber point A. So raw materials are 216000. It means that out of this 2700,000, we are committing some other expenses too. So 2700,000 minus 216000 remaining 540,000 is for other expenses. Together, they are making the cost of sales. Got it? So this is what they were requiring us to do. And now we are simply going to calculate the holding period. So first, let's calculate about the raw material holding period. Raw material holding period. Harshit, what is the formula? You must memorize the formulas now. Yeah. Yes, raw materials. How much raw materials are there? No, over there. That is the balance only. 2160. 60000 divided by? Divided by what? Divided by cost of sales. Okay. Okay. Now over here, the balance held for raw materials is 150,000. So yes, the balance will be 150,000. This is the balance out of the raw materials, which are over there out of the cost of sales. So it is 2160, multiplied by 365. Closing raw materials. Closing inventory, we do take. Do you remember? We do take closing inventory. So 150,000 out of the cost of sales, cost of sales for raw materials is 216. So how many days are there? It is 25 more people. 25. So, yes, you can consider 25 days. Okay, now in the same way, calculate for work in progress. Calculate for finished goods. Calculate for all these. work in progress and finished goods take the full cost of sales okay because we are not only taking the raw materials now so for work in progress it's 350000 divided by cost of sales is 2700000 multiply by 365 so it's 47 days for finished goods finished goods are 200000 divided by 2700,000 multiplied by 365. So it's 27 days. Got it, Hashim? Okay, then we are going to calculate the receivables collection period. What is the formula? Receivables divided by sales. So 306,000 divided by 2600,000 multiplied by 365. Oh, what is the name of the other student? I forgot. Atif. Atif. Do you have any idea why he has not come yet? Okay, so 31 days for it. Okay, now the last one which we have to calculate. Payables, payment periods. So what is the formula? Payables are related to which thing? Cost of sales. And if they are differentiating among raw materials and others, it means that payables are related to the raw materials. Okay? Because these are trade payables. Basically, these are trade payables. So, which payables are, uh, how much trade payables are there? 130,000 divided by raw material balance 216000 multiplied by 365. So, how much it is? 130,000 divided by 216000. Multiply by 365. So it's 22 days. Okay, so now receivables collection period is how much, Hashem? So collection period is yeah. 31 days. Raw materials, 25 days. Work in progress, 27 days. Finished goods, 47. 47? Are you sure? Yes, 40. No. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. 47 and then 27. And then we are going to deduct the payables payment period that is 
ट्वेंटी टू डेज ट्वेंटी टू डेज सो अवर कैश ऑपरेटिंग साइकिल विल बी थर्टी वन प्लस ट्वेंटी फाइव प्लस फोर्टी सेवन प्लस ट्वेंटी सेवन माइनस ट्वेंटी टू सो इट्स वन हंड्रेड एट डेज अवर कैश गेट्स स्टक फॉर वन हंड्रेड डेज इन ऑर्डर टू कंप्लीट दी साइकिल ओके गॉट इट नाउ so this is how we are going to get it in the exam also they do ask in this way so that they can get all the workings in one question can you please call out this Is there? 
Okay, so what are our current assets given? Can you see? Yeah. Yes, here are current assets. 74 for 2007 and 65 for 2006. 65 for 2006 and for 2007, these are 74. Now see the current liabilities. Under current liabilities, we have payables and taxation. So 46, 65 and 46 respectively. 65 and 46. Do tell me if I will make any mistake. Is this 65? So 2006? Yes, 46. Yes, 2006 at 65. And for 2007, 46. Is it? Okay, so over here for 2006, it's just one. It means that our current assets are exactly equal to the current liabilities. Whenever our current liabilities will be falling due, we will be in a position to fulfill them. Okay, but they are exactly the same as our current assets. So we need to be a little bit careful about that too. Now over here, current assets are a little bit more than current liabilities, so the ratio will be more than one. How much it is? 1.61, one point six one. which means that our uh, current assets are almost 50% more than our current liability. So we are in a secure position, but this is not enough. The organizations need to consider the amount of inventory in their current assets as well. Sometimes because their inventory is slow moving, that is why their, their ratio is looking the favorable. So they do need to see the amount of inventory as well. That is why they go for quick ratio also. So what are our current assets? Current assets have been 65 in 2006 and current liabilities were also 65. 74 and we have to detect inventory. Now let's see the amount of inventory. Students, what is the amount of inventory? It's, uh, <laughs> 42 and 37 and 42 respectively. Is it? Yes, 37 and 42. Now calculate the quick ratio. Now look, after deducting the inventory, how our quick ratio has deteriorated, which means that the organization is dealing with the slow moving inventory. The organization might not be able to convert its inventory to the sales. That is why its current ratio has been looking favorable. Okay, what about this year, 2007? 0.7. Now in both the years, you can see that both the ratios are improving. Both the ratios are improving. The organization might have been struggling with the ratios or they might have done something better in order to improve their ratios. So anyhow, in both the years, the position is looking for more favor. As you can see, the inventory amount has also been increased, but our current assets have also been increased from 65 to 74. On the other hand, our current liabilities have decreased. That is the other reason that our ratios are becoming improved. So we have done with the first part, we are done. Calculate the liquidity ratios in 2006 and 7. Calculate the length of the cash operating cycle in 2006 and 2007. So what is the formula for cash operating cycle? We have discussed in the previous example as well. Just for you, Hashira, I'm repeating it. Cash operating cycle, the formula is receivables collection period plus inventory holding period minus trade payables payment period. So this is the operating cycle. This is the time lag between the payment to be received from the receivables and payments to be paid back to the payables. So we are going to calculate that because they are requiring for 2006 and 2007. So one by one, we are going to calculate all the payments. So first we have to analyze that which inventories do we have. Only inventory they have given us, there is no differentiation among uh, among work in progress, raw materials, and finished goods. So total amount of the inventory is going to be taken straight away. So what is the formula for inventory holding period as we have discussed? What is the formula? Atit, can you tell me? Yours. Inventory holding period? Yeah. What is the formula? No, no. Inventory. Inventory divided by cost of, cost of sales, multiplied by 365. Okay, so use this formula to calculate inventory holding period, then we do have receivables collection period. What is the formula? 
No. Very good. Receivables divided by actually credit sales we do take, or if not, we can take the full sales revenue multiplied by 365. And then the last one is payables, collection period, and the formula is? Very good. Payables divided by purchases. If purchases are not given, we can simply take the cost of sales. Multiply by 365. Now, do use all these formulas. Students, are we going to take inventory on the or the uh, average inventory? Average inventory. Average inventory. Do take the average inventory because they have differentiated. If they have not differentiated, then it's okay. You can take the closing inventory only. But because they are differentiating among opening and closing inventory, that is why you need to take the uh, average of it. So for 2006, can I write here? Is it fine for you? Fine for you both? Okay, for 2006, the average inventory would be 42 plus uh, opening inventory 37. Yes, 42 plus 37 divided by 2, divided by cost of sales. Uh, Atif, can you please change the feed because uh, Hashid is having flu. So you will be catching it. Okay, and cost of sales, how much cost of sales are there? Yes, cost of sales are, sorry, I have taken the figures of 2007, okay? So cost of sales for 2007 are 157. And for 2006, inventory is 37 plus 29, 37 plus 29 divided by two, whereas cost of sales are 151. Multiply by 365. Multiply by 365. Can you please tell me the answer for 2007? How much it is? 92 days. 92 days. And for 2006? 80 80 days. Now, my dear students, you can see that the inventory holding period is improving. From 92 days, it has now become 80 days. It means that now the organization is becoming more efficient to convert its inventory into the sales. Organization is get, taking lesser time to convert to make the sales possible. Okay. Uh, they have increased the days for many Oh, yes, it has been. For 2007, it has increased. Okay, so it has increased, it means that the organization is now taking more time, the organization is not efficient enough to run its operations in order to improve the position, organization might have to work on its credit policies, organization might have to work on its marketing policies, while improving all these obviously certain more costs are going to be spent, but the organization will be able to convert its inventory into the sales. Moreover, the organization might have to think that if the inventory is perishable or in the inventory we do have items which are going to have a tendency of becoming obsolete or outdated, organization need to be very much careful regarding that as well. Now, my dear students, one more thing you need to be commenting over here that these uh, accounting, the, the, these uh, ratios are not enough to consider the overall picture. The organization might have to consider the market ratios as well. They have to compare their ratios with their competitors in order to be very much sure that whether they are improving or not. Okay, then we are going to calculate about the receivables collection period for 2007. The receivables are? For 2007, the receivables are how much? 29, is it? 29. And what are the sales for 2007? 209. 209 multiplied by 365. For 2006, how much receivables are there? 23. 
and revenue for 2006 is 196 multiplied by 365. So how much it is? Uh, 43. 43 days? 51 days. 51 days. No, oh. uh, 43 from 2006. Okay. 43 days and 51 days. Now again, we can see that the receivables collection period is increasing. It means that the organization is now taking more time in order to recover its debts from the receivables. Moreover, there can be another case as well. If say, for example, your numerator is increasing with the high intensity as compared to the denominator, even then the receivables collection period would be more efficient, would be seen to be more efficient. Over here, as you can see, the revenue, the receivables figure has also increased. Whereas the uh, revenue figure has also increased. So because your denominator has increased with the lesser proportion as compared to the numerator, that is why your receivables collection period has increased. Anyhow, the organization has to work on its credit policies so that the receivables collection period can be bring to lesser amount. The more the receivables collection period is going to be, it becomes more difficult to recover the debts from the receivables. And again, the organization might have to compare its ratios with the market as well. Now we are going to calculate the payables collection period. So what are the payables for 2007 students? So what are the payables you are going to pay? Sorry, which one? 55 and 36. 55 and 36. And now we are going to see the purchases. How much purchases are there? If they would not have given us purchases, we might have taken the cost of sales only. The purchases for 2007 are 162. And the purchases for 2006 are 159. So how much payable days are there for 2007? 81 days. 81 days. And for 2006? 126 days. Okay, now as you can see that the payable days are decreasing. What does that mean? That now the organization is taking lesser time to give the payables back. Organization is taking lesser time to give the amount of the payables due. But over here, you need to consider that whenever the organization is having more payable days, it works as the free finance for the organization, free credit for the organization. So when the organizations do try to improve their working capital, they sometimes try to delay the payments to their trade payables. But over here, maybe the organization was losing its uh, payables. Maybe the suppliers were not ready to supply the goods to the organization because it was taking more time to fulfill the obligations. So that's why organization has decreased its trade payable days. Anyhow, the organization has now become more efficient to fulfill its obligations and taking less time to pay its trade payables. Are you clear? So this is how you are going to appraise the performance. Only just the calculation is not enough in the exam. You need to interpret and comment well in the examination. Now, my dear students, we are going to consider about the working capital investment levels as well. Sometimes in the exam or sometimes in the practical situation, you might be uh, worried to know about the working capital investment, how much amount of money you should be investing in the working capital. Like all the other amounts of capital, working capital is also very significant for the organization and organization from time to time to plan, do uh, make the financial management for the working capital as well, that how much money they do require to invest in the working capital. So what we are going to do, we are just going to rearrange the formulas for working capital and we are going to find the investments in the working capitals. Like for over here, we are rearranging the formula for trade receivables days. What is the formula for trade receivables days? It's just trade receivables divided by credit sales multiplied by 365. If we do want to see the trade receivables balance, we are just going to rearrange the formula. Trade receivables balance is equal to trade receivables days multiplied by credit sales divided by 365. So this is what our formula is going to become. And we will be able to know that how much amount in the trade receivables we need to invest. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, you're using a term credit sales. In case if uh, the example specifies that when they have one million of sale out of which 800 is credit sales, so shall we consider full sale? Or no, 800. In that case, you need to consider only credit sales. Okay. Otherwise, full sales you are going to consider. So same is the case with the purchases and cost of sales. If they are not giving you the purchases, then take the full amount of the cost of sales. If they are differentiating, then you have to take the purchases amount in the trade pay purchase. Got it? Clear now. Okay, so this is how we are going to arrange. Okay, the same is going to happen in the case of the trade uh, payable balances as well. We are just going to rearrange the formula. Same is going to happen in the case of inventory balance as well. So these balances will be telling us the amount of the working capital investment and how are we going to calculate the working capital investment by using the same similar formula which we have used in the cash operating cycle. What was that? Trade receivables plus inventory minus trade payables. So like this, we are going to know that how much investment in the working capital is required at any time. So they say the working capital ratios can be used to predict the future levels of investment required. This is done by rearranging the formulas. So one example they have given and the other examples I have shown. Okay, now students with this, we have ended the chapter. Actually, this chapter has been discussed in our previous lecture and this was just the end of the lecture. So I have added some practice questions here as well. You are required to compute the working capital requirements. So they have given you the inventory days, receivable days, payable days, and now they are asking you to calculate the working capital requirements. So just start rearranging the formulas and calculate it for inventory balance. What is the formula? Can anyone tell me? Inventory days divided by? Divided multiply by 365. Oh. Uh, sorry, divided by 365 multiplied by? Multiply by cost of sales. Okay, then we have to calculate. Okay, first calculate this one. Inventory days are 30 divided by 365. Multiply by cost of sales. And how much? Material cost we are going to take. So it is six. And median sales. Okay, so how much is inventory balance? 0 0.4 million. Okay, 493 million. Uh, no, it's okay because otherwise you can calculate it in 100,000, okay? Because it's median figure, that is why we are not going to round it. So 0 0.493 million inventory balance, then receivables balance. What are we going to do with that? Receivable days divided by 365 multiplied by credit sales. So receivable days are how much? 60 divided by 365 multiplied by credit sales. Now look over here, they have not given us credit sales. So all the sales are going to be taken, that is 10 million. 1.64 million. Okay, then payable, payable salaries. So how much payables are there? 40 divided by? Material. Yes, no. You, you are going to take materials. Okay, if you are taking an exam, if you feel, if you assume that this other cost is also related to the payables, then you can add, okay? Because you are at such level that where you can make assumptions. Otherwise, you must know that we are over here concerned with the trade payables. Look over here, they have not told us about trade papers. That is why you can take both of these as well, or you can take simply materials if you are assuming that we are related to the trade papers, okay? So 40 million divided by six, oh, sorry, 365 multiplied by six million. So how much it is? 0 0.65 million. So what would be the working capital investment? 0 0.493 plus 1.64 minus 0 0.65 million. This would be the working up. Yes. In case, like, as, as I said, as, uh, as we can assume that. So, shall we specify that assumption more than that? Yes. Yes. Whatever you are assuming, you have to. You have to write below to the question that you are assuming this. Okay? So, this is what you are going to do. Clear? Okay, now understanding number five. Be the effects on the company's cash operating cycle and liquidity ratios if this change were to be achieved. 
a company has the liquidity ratio equal to 0.5 the directors believe that the company has to reduce its bank overdraft and have agreed to alter the company's credit terms to the customers from 2 months to 1 month what could be the effect of this on the cash operating cycle is it going to increase or decrease Decrease. Decrease, okay. Was it just? So, uh, because they are reducing their liability from the bank and they are trying to take uh, credit from the customer. So, then one side they are uh, increasing and the other is decreasing. Very good. So, cash operating cycle is going to decrease. Okay, what about the liquidity ratio? Okay. Uh, they are trying to write off the liability, so in this case, uh, the liquidity ratio will be. Yes, this is the case. So both of the ratios are going to decrease. Uh, sorry, cash operating cycle is also going to decrease, and liquidity ratio is also going to decrease. Ashir, are you clear? Yes. So both the ratios are going to decrease. Very good, Ashir. Okay, understanding number six. The key trade off that lies at the heart of working capital management is that between. Business stability and solvency, debtors and creditors, current assets and current liabilities, or liquidity and profitability. B, right? No, it's B. First, you were right, now you are wrong. Yeah. In all the cases, in all the cases in working capital, whatever is involved, we are going to consider the liquidity and profitability. We have to balance liquidity and profitability between the over trading and uh, you know, the liquidity problem is going to arise. So liquidity and profitability, whatever working capital management is there, we are going to consider that. Okay, now which of the following is not the typical symptom of over trading? What is over trading, by the way? Um, when the organization is increasing its sales revenue, but liquidity is disturbed at the cost of increasing revenue. So, which of the following is not a typical system of over trading? Which one of the following is not going to tell that whether the organization is over trading? A rapid increase in the sales revenue. When the sales revenue increases, it is a symptom of over trading. Is it? So, yes, this is not the answer. Because they are asking not a typical system. So this is a symptom of overtrading. When sales revenue is going to increase, we can say that company is overtrading. A bank overdraft, which may reach the limit of facilities agreed by the bank. Again, overtrading. Again, this will be a symptom of overtrading. A decrease in the current ratio and the quick ratio. This is a symptom of overtrading. When your current assets are going to drop and your current liabilities, it is a symptom of overtrading. A decrease in trade payables days, this is not a symptom of overtrading. When the trade payables days are increasing, actually the company is working on liquidity. When the company is trying to get its debts in lesser time periods. So this is not a symptom of overtrading, this is a symptom of liquidity. Okay. Students, so last two questions you can try from your homes. Every time there are some questions which we leave for homework. Okay, now working capital management inventory control. Under working capital management, we need to learn that how we must need to uh, balance our inventory as well. When the company tries to invest more in the inventory, what happens then? The company is over trading. But on the other hand, when the company is not investing its inventory, the company is trying to be liquid, but it means that the company may have some of the problems also. What problems those can be? When the suppliers are not uh, you know, ready to supply the goods to the company and the customers are requiring the quantity, the supply from the company, the company is going to be stuck. So the organization might need to work in an efficient manner in order to have a balance among liquidity and profitability in the case of inventory as well. So the company needs to manage its inventory. And in this chapter, we are going to learn about the objectives, the balancing act, Inventory management systems, calculating three order levels, calculating economic order quantity, that is EOQ. We are going to discuss about the concept of JIT, that is just in time, and how we can calculate the EOQ when there are discounts available. So we are going to learn all of these. Students, please stay focused and please make sure that you are able to comment on all the things which we are learning. Because here the objective in the financial management, especially in the working capital portion, 
you will be required to comment. If any of the question can come from the working capital, it will be having some part of commenting and interpretation in it as well, okay? So the objective in the inventory management is again to have a balance among profitability and liquidity. If the company is becoming more liquid and is not investing in the inventory, there can be the problems. The company might not be having the discounts, when the company is purchasing more inventory, obviously the company do get quantity discounts. If the company is focusing more on the liquidity and is not purchasing an inventory, obviously the company will be depriving itself of the discounts. On the other hand, when the company is trying to be more liquid and is not investing in the inventory, whenever there is some kind of order, urgency is there, the company would not be able to fulfill it and the company will not be having the sales revenue earned out of it. On the other hand, if the company is not focusing on the profitability, stakeholders, shareholders of the company would not be happy return on capital employed would be decreasing. <coughs> Excuse me. So the company would be depriving itself of the profits and the shareholders return is going to become lesser. So at every time, the company must have to focus to get a balance in between liquidity and profitability. So what your book says about it, inventory is the major investment for many companies. Manufacturing companies can easily be carrying inventory equivalent to between 50% and 100% of the revenue of the business. It is therefore essential to reduce the levels of inventory held to the necessary minimum. And in order to reduce the inventory, you know, we are following the Japanese techniques nowadays. And JIT, which, were, which we were discussing uh, right now in the overview also, just in time is one of the Japanese techniques like TQM also. So over there, what we learned actually that whenever we are requiring the inventory at that time only, we are going to order it. So what happens in that case, if we are not having the good contracts or good terms with, the, uh, with our suppliers, then we would not be able to work with JIT just in time. So we need to pay our payables in time. So when we are going to pay our payables in time, on one side, our liquidity is going to be affected. Am I right? We would not be able to get free finance from the trade payables. And on the other hand, we are putting that amount in the inventory and we are fixing, we are fixing our inventory. We are actually stucking our inventory in our warehouse. So we are going to consider all these portions also. So liquidity means reducing inventory to the lowest possible amount to minimize the level of capital employed to be funded. And profitability ensuring that sufficient inventory is held so that it does not run out and disrupt business. So in both the things, we need to keep a proper balance. Now, my dear students, if the organization is having an inventory, if the organization is focusing on the profitability and if the organization is having more inventory in its warehouse, it's not free of cost. The organization has to bear the cost for that. And those costs are going to be differentiated in two. Cost of ordering inventory and cost of holding inventory. These are the two basic costs of inventory which we are going to bear. What is the cost of holding inventory? The cost of warehouse, the cost of insurance. These are the costs of holding inventory. On the other hand, when we are holding the inventory, it means that the amount which we are stucking in the inventory can be used somewhere else in order to generate interest, in order to generate return. So that is also the cost, finance cost, which is going to be foregone. That is the opportunity cost, which we have now stuck in the inventory. So that is the cost of holding inventory. On the other hand, we do have cost of ordering inventory as well. Say, for example, whenever you have to make an order, admin cost is going to be there, obviously. Whenever you have to order, obviously, there will be transport cost also. So there are certain costs involved in order to order the inventory as well. In your examination, you must be able to calculate the cost of holding and cost of ordering inventory. But first, let's consider that what can be the cost of high inventory level and what can be the cost of low inventory levels, which we have discussed generally too. So the cost of high inventory levels will be holding costs like storage, uh, stores, administration, risk of theft, damage, obsolescence. We are going to have foregone interest from tying up capital in the inventory. If we are having lesser inventory, we can be having stockouts and for stockouts, there will be lost contribution production stoppages, emergency orders, high reorder setup costs will be there, lost quantity discounts will be there if we are having lesser inventory. 
Now students, what is the challenge? The challenge is the objective of good inventory management is therefore to determine the optimum reorder level. What is a reorder level? How much inventory should be present in the warehouse when we need to have a given order for inventory? That is the reorder level. Say for example, our lead time. Lead time is the delivery time uh, of the inventory to our warehouse. So for example, our suppliers do take two weeks to supply the inventory to our warehouse. So our reorder level should be the amount of inventory to be consumed in that two weeks, okay? How much inventory should be present in our warehouse at that time we need to give the reorder, you know, the optimum reorder level, how many items are left in inventory when the next order is placed and optimum reorder quantity, how much quantity of the inventory we need to place in order. How many items should be ordered when the order is placed? For all material inventory items in practice, this means striking a balance between holding costs on the one hand and stock out and reorder costs on the other. So we need to have a balance between ordering costs and holding costs. So the key point, the balancing act between liquidity and profitability, which might also be considered to be trade-off between holding costs and stockouts, reorder costs is the key to any discussion on inventory management. So if you will be asked to comment on any of the situation, you must be looking forward to this point that you have to be getting a balance in between these two things. Okay, what are the terminologies? Lead time. What is the lead time? It is the time which your supplier will be taking to deliver the inventory to your warehouse, okay? Then buffer inventory. What is the buffer inventory? It is the inventory which you have uh, in your premises, in your warehouse in the time of need. So they say lead time is the lag between when an order is placed and the item is delivered. Buffer inventory, the basic level of inventory kept for emergencies. I hope that you are clear about it. Now, students, we are going to extend our discussion regarding inventory management, and we are going to learn about EOQ, economic order quantity. Economic over here does not mean cheaper. We are not concerned about having the cheaper inventory. We are concerned about having the inventory which would be more economical for the organization which will be more beneficial for the organization, which will be bringing the least cost to the organization. Sometimes with the discount, it will be good for us to buy the products. Sometimes it will be just without the discounts in which the, re, uh, in which the ordering cost and the holding cost would be the minimum. So we are going to be concerned about calculating such amount of the, such quantity of the inventory, which would be more economical for us. That is the concept of EOQ, economic order quantity. So as you can see in the challenge, they say the aim of the EOQ model is to minimize the total cost of holding and inventory, ordering inventory. So at the point where our holding cost and our ordering cost would be the minimum, would be the economic order quantity. Got it? If say, for example, we have three quantities under consideration, either we can order 5,000 units or 6,000 units or 7,000 units. We are going to see that at which level our ordering costs and our holding costs are the least, and that would be our economic order quantity. So our challenge is to minimize the cost of holding and ordering. So they say for businesses that do not use just-in-time inventory management systems, there is an optimum order quantity for inventory items known as EOQ. To minimize the total cost of holding and ordering inventory, it is necessary to balance the relevant costs. What are relevant costs? Future incremental cash flows. These are the variable costs of holding the inventory, the fixed cost of placing the order. So it means holding costs and ordering costs. Now students, in this graph, if you can see, whenever the reorder quantity is increasing, whenever the quantity which you have to reorder is going to increase, your holding cost is also going to increase. Got it? Your holding cost is going to increase. Whenever the reorder quantity is increasing, your ordering cost is going to reduce. The more they are having ordering cost and reorder quantity is having the positive correlation, uh, sorry, negative correlation, whereas the reorder quantity and the holding cost is having the positive correlation. Okay, economic order quantity is the one where the graph of holding cost and ordering cost is going to cross each other. And this is the point where total cost is minimum. So this is EOQ, economic order quantity. So they say 
about um, yes holding cost here the formula for holding cost actually i have written it by myself sorry cost of holding cost of holding you might have discussed this very earlier in uh, f2 in management accounting this was the concept in f5 also so you might have discussed if you have or what uh, and over there in those books they have written the formulas in detail in this book you are not going to find the formulas in detail anyhow i have tried my best to uh, calculate the you know things and i have written the formulas for everything so i hope that you might not be having the problem so so they say the average level of the inventory increases so too will the total annual holding cost so when the average level of the inventory is going to increase the annual holding cost is also going to increase and how are you going to calculate the annual holding cost average inventory multiplied by holding cost per unit got it that is also known as ch so holding cost per unit multiplied by average units is your annual holding cost as as the order quantity increases there is a fall in the number of orders required which reduces the total ordering cost ordering cost can be calculated as number of orders multiplied by cost per order students in order to calculate the number of orders the formula which you basically no. use is d by very good annual demand divided by order quantity okay so if you want to write it you can write because in book in this book it's not written so d stands for annual demand and quant q stands for order Okay, now students, you will not be asked in for assumptions in any way in the examination, but still I have uh, included them. What are the basic assumptions which you are going to keep in mind while calculating the EOQ? That demand and lead time are constant and known. In practical situations, demand and lead time are never constant. Okay, they are going to be fluctuating. But in order to apply EOQ, you have to assume that they are constant, and then purchase price is constant, and there is no buffer inventory held. So what is the formula of EOQ? Two CO under root two CO D divided by CH, where CO is order cost per order, D is annual demand, and CH is cost of holding one unit for one year. This formula will be given to you in the exam. Okay, in the formula sheet, this is going to be given to you in exam. One thing which you need to consider in the exam sometimes what the students I have seen students what they see, what they do they take annual cost of ordering here this is the cost per order okay D is annual demand and C H is cost of holding one unit for one this is not the annual holding cost okay previous formulas which we have seen students these formulas which we have seen these are for annual holding cost and annual order cost okay. But the formulas which we are going to use here, these are cost per order and cost of holding one unit. Okay, so try to differentiate this as well. Okay, now understanding number one. Here in this understanding, in the first, yes, in the first understanding, we are going to make sure that we are clear about the idea of EOQ. Okay, requirement as you can see, investigate the total cost of buying the material. In quantities of 400, 500, or 600 units at one time, what is the cheapest option? So first, you are going to calculate individually for 400, 500, and 600 units, and then use the EOQ formula to prove your answer is correct. Now, what they are trying to tell you? When I was elaborating the concept of EOQ, I told you people that EOQ is the quantity at which your cost of holding and cost of ordering would be minimum one. So you can calculate the cost of ordering and cost of holding at all the three levels. And you are going to compare your answer with the EOQ, the answer would be the same. Okay, so individually you are going to calculate the annual holding cost and ordering cost for 400, 500, 600 units, and then you are simply going to calculate the EOQ. So let's start doing it together. Next question you can try by yourself. A company requires 1000 units of material X per month. Now over here again, the students do the mistake and the demand is given in per month. They do take this, this amount of demand, but you have to convert it to annual demand, multiply by 12. 
The cost per order is 30, regardless of the size of order, the holding costs are 2.88 per unit per annum. So very straightforward information we have given with us. The quantities are 400, 500 and 600. Students calculate the average inventory cost because in order to calculate holding cost, we need an average inventory. Am I right? What is the formula for holding cost? Holding, holding cost per unit multiplied by average inventory. The only given. Sorry? The only given. No, the, this is the level of inventory, not the average. Average inventory is inventory divided by 2. So 400 divided by 2, 200, 500 divided by 2, 250, 600 divided by 2, 300. Right? Okay, now what you have to do, you have to calculate the cost of holding. What is the formula of cost of holding inventory? As I have told you, this is holding cost per unit multiplied by average inventory. So cost of holding per unit, if you can see 2.88 per unit. So 2.88 multiplied by 200 or 400 units. 2.88 multiplied by 200, 576. 2.88 multiplied by 250, 720. 2.88 multiplied by 300, 864. 864. So are you clear? Now we are going to calculate the cost of ordering. What is the formula? Cost of ordering one unit multiplied by number of orders. How do we calculate the number of orders? Annual demand divided by order quantity. Okay, now cost of ordering one unit is how much? 30, is it? And number of orders for every quantity you have to calculate. So I will be doing 40 first. Cost of ordering one unit, one is 30. Number of orders, annual demand is how much? 1,000 units is monthly and multiplied by 12. 12,000 divided by order quantity. Order quantity is how much? 400 units for the first case. For the first case, this is 400. For the second case, 500. For the third case, 600. So divided by 400, how much it is? 30. Sorry? No, total. 30 multiplied by 1,900. Are you sure? Okay, so 900 for 400, then 500 units, how much? 12,000 divided by 500 multiplied by 30. Seven twenty. Okay, then twelve thousand divided by six hundred multiplied by thirty. Six hundred. Now, my dear students, you normally do add the purchase cost as well, but over here you can see that the purchase cost is not given to us. Sometimes, in order to do the questions like this, you do add the purchase cost also, but over here it's not given, so it's not relevant. Okay, so calculate the total now. How much it is? 576 plus 900? 1476. 1470. 1440. 1464. So which one is the most economic quantity? 500 units is the EOQ. EOQ is 500 units. Now, when you are going to apply the formula of EOQ, you will be getting 500 units. Now, this is the concept. Okay, EOQ is basically the quantity at which your ordering cost and cost of holding is the minimum. So what is the formula? This will be given to you in the exam, 2COD divided by CH. Apply this formula. Cost of ordering is how much? 30. Annual demand is 12,000. Cost of holding is 2.88. Are you sure? 
No, you must be getting 500. Are you taking at the root? Yeah. Give it to me. I do not have the scientific definition. It must be 500 units. Yes. Take under root of 250,000, it's 500. Okay. Atif, have you got the same? Yes. Okay. So economic water quantity is 500. Now the sec second question, you are required to calculate the EOQ. So apply the same formula with the help of this. Now over here, can you see they have added the point of cost of finance as well? Yeah. This one is cost of holding inventory. Cost of finance. Do you remember I told you that when you are holding an inventory, you are not able to invest the amount somewhere else. So cost of finance, opportunity cost, which you are losing is also the part of cost of holding. Okay. Okay, good this. One hundred twenty thousand, right? Sorry. So one hundred twenty thousand. Yes. This will be the cost of holding students. Cost of finance and warehouse storage cost. Two. Cost of ordering two hundred. Five, six, Sorry? Five, six, seven, nine. Five, six, seven, nine. Both of you are getting the same? Wait, no. Storage cost payment. Oh, okay, okay, okay. What is CH 10 multiplied by 15%? Plus two? 3.5. 3 3 Annual demand is 120,000. Divided by COS? 120,000 units. 120,000 units. units. We don't have cost of orders. No. Annual demand is in units. No, wait. Cost of orders is 200. Uh, Holding is 200. Not that is monthly. Effort. That is 200 per order. Yeah, so two COD, right? The, that is CO. Oh, sorry. Oh, my God. Sorry, sorry. That is 3.5. Cost of holding is 3.5. This three one? Seven, three seven zero five. Three seven zero five? Answer is three seven. Okay. I don't know. This would say it's If the answers are same. Okay. We don't open the root yet. Okay, so we is getting 3705, might be rounding, okay? So uh, are you clear about the concept, students? Are you practicing the exam yet? Yes. <laughs> students, without exam yet, we cannot succeed in the exam. Please. Because in exam kit questions, they are actually uh, taking the ideas from the exam. Okay. Now, EOQ with discount. If sometimes the discount is offered on the purchase of an inventory, we are going to be having a discount also. But it's not necessary that if we are having the discount, the quantity which we are going to get is our economic order quantity. 
our economic order quantity can be the one which is not going to give us any discount. Say, for example, if we have calculated the EOQ as 2,000 units, if we are going to order 2,000 units, our cost of holding and ordering would be the least. But your supplier says that if you are going to uh, purchase 2,500 units, then the discount is going to be offered. It means that your EOQ is not actually the quantity at which the discounts can be attracted. So what do you have to do in that case? They have written these steps. First, you have to calculate the EOQ in the normal way, ignoring discounts. Then you are going to calculate with discounts, and then you are going to compare the results. And whatever benefits you are having, you are going to take that. Here is understanding we are going to do that so that we can understand the concept. Requirement is calculate the EOQ, ignoring the discount, and determine if it would, be, if it would change once the discount is taken into account. So first, can I request you to calculate EOQ? And now they have given us the annual demand, 30,000 barrels. Three one six two. Three one six two. Have you used the same formula? So EOQ is three one six two. Now they say a two percent discount is available on the orders of at least five thousand barrels, and two point five percent if the quantity is seven thousand five hundred barrels. It means that both the quantities are above your EOQ. So what you are going to do? Just check. You will be comparing your answers. You are going to see the total cost at 3162 units. That is your EOQ. You are going to calculate the total cost at 5,000 units. You are going to calculate your total cost at 7,500 units. You are going to compare the results. Whichever is giving you the least, quant least amount of money is going to be your answer. Now, in this cost, you are going to include the purchase cost as well. Can you see they have given us the purchase cost? So we have to include that as well. And the formula will be for purchase cost for annual purchase cost. The formula is purchase cost per unit multiplied by annual demand. Okay. So now start doing it. Calculate the ordering costs. Average inventory first you can calculate, then calculate ordering cost. Quantity will be 3162, right? Sorry? Quantity will be 3162. 3162. So quantity has to be changed. 5,000 and then 7,500. Ordering cost, holding cost, purchase cost. Students, please follow this approach in the book. This approach is not followed. When you are going to see the solution, you are going to find very ambiguity over there. Okay? Do follow this approach so that your answers will be very simplified for you. They will be giving you the same answers, but they have followed a little bit detailed approach. So follow this approach in the exam as well. Uh, annual purchase must be purchased into demand. Purchase is into demand. Purchase cost is two. And annual demand is written 30,000 barrels. But this purchase cost will not be due for every, every number of units. Because for 5,000 units, there is a discount. For 7,500 units, there is a discount. Otherwise, no use to calculate the purchase cost.
is compare the answers. Do not see the force only, just compare your answers. Number of orders will be computed based on the Sorry? number of orders will be computed based on the average. No, holding for that, that is for holding cost. Number of orders will be D over Q. Angle demand is 30,000 in quantity. Order quantity is 3162 here, 5,000 units here, 7,500 units here. Okay? And cost per order is say 200. Holding cost is going to be calculated on the basis of average inventory. Holding cost per unit multiplied by average inventory. Even if you are taking the simple inventory, even then the answer is not going to be changed because you are dividing all the inventory with two. But for concept to tell the examiner that we know the concept you do this, okay? Three thousand four thousand five. Okay, now purchase cost that is P multiplied by N by demand, but purchase price is going to reduce. Let me just write it also. For the first case, the purchase cost is two, simple two, and N by demand is thirty thousand. For the second case. For 5,000 units, it is going to reduce by 2%. So 2 multiplied by, it will be 98% only. It's 2%, yes. So 98% multiplied by 30,000. For third case, 2 and it is reducing by 2.5%. So it will be 97.5 multiplied by 30,000, okay? So in that case, then it will become 60,000 for this. And then you multiply by 98%, multiply by 30,000. Five double eight double zero for second case. You multiply by 30,000. No, 58,500. 58,500 plus 4,500. Plus 800. The total cost in this case is 63800. 58800 plus 3000 plus 1200. For this case, it is 63000. And for this case, 60,000 plus 1897 plus 1898. So 63795. So which one is the most suitable quantity? 5,000. Look, our economic order quantity was 316. But in this case, the most suitable one is 63,000, uh, 5,000. Now in book, what they have done, the answer is the same. Everything is the same. But they are comparing step by step the costs with each other. They are calculating the ordering cost and then they are comparing them with each other. They are calculating holding costs and comparing them. Calculating purchase cost and comparing them. Okay, so follow this approach in this way, the question will become more easier. Now, over here, what is the net benefit which you are getting? If you are ordering 5,000 units, the benefit is 795 over here and almost 800 from here. So, the net benefit which you are getting is almost 795 or 800. Got it? To order 5,000 units. Atif, are you getting here? Yes. It means that if we order six uh, five thousand units, so we are at the lower cost of yes, yes, we are going to get the lowest cost. So we should be instead of ordering three one six two, we should be going for five thousand units. So in this case, we are not going to go for economic order quantity. We will be going for 5,000 units because there is a scene of discount. Okay, now understanding number 
Four is there, E or Q, when this comes to. Can you try this by yourself? The same approach you need to follow. Sorry? Six, six o'clock. Six o'clock. From your homes, you are going to do that. So you because you have wasted a lot of time in the start. I, I have a test, but in the class, we would not be able to do that. No, not you also. You came to a 12 minutes late. Oh, I swear I heard three six. No. Three six. I okay, anyhow. Do this understanding quickly. Why? We need to finish the syllabus. Adip, are you doing revision kit? Why? Because last one we this. So you have an exam and without without revision kit, it's not possible. In the end, we are going to do only few questions from the revision kit, but that would be not enough. From today, uh, midnight, I will be free. Okay. Because today is the 28th last day, because of 58. That would be fine. That would so be fine. Be because Whatever we are going to try, we would not be able to do each and every question from the revision kit. Only few questions we would be able, but I was thinking that you can try from the revision kit in which questions you are having problem to us, we can discuss. So anyhow, I have a plan to finish the syllabus around, you know, up till 20th, we are going to finish, inshallah. For the last 10 days, you will be getting. Yes, zero point five percent. So the purchase price is going to be reduced. It will be uh, ninety nine point five percent.
optimal order quantity is EOQ. In the exam, they can ask you with both the you know, terms. How much is left? Purchase cost ratio. Sorry? Ratio. Okay, optimal order quantity can be EOQ, but it is basically the order quantity which would be most beneficial for the organization. So with discount, it may or may not be EOQ. Okay, every time it's not going to be EOQ. Just shall we move on? Okay. Done? Yeah. Six thousand. Six thousand? Optimal order quantity is six thousand? What about you, Arthur? Six thousand? Great. It means that you are clear about the idea. Okay, now, now students, reorder level. What is the reorder level? How much amount of inventory should be in stock when you do order for the next inventory? We do assume that if the lead time is constant, then reorder level is the annual, is the usage in that lead time. How much amount of inventory is going to be used in that lead time? So they say non-demanded lead time, having decided how much inventory to reorder, the next problem is when to reorder. The firm needs to identify the level of inventory which can be reached before an order needs to be placed. The reorder level is the quantity of inventory on hand when an order is placed. When demanded, when demand and lead time are known with certainty, the reorder level may be calculated exactly that is reorder level is, uh, is equal to demand and lead time. Okay, so when you are required to calculate reorder level, if demand and lead time are constant, then your reorder level would be exactly the same as the demand in the lead time. But what about reorder time? How frequently you need to place an order? How often you need to place an order? In your book, they have not given the formula for reorder time, but they are asking in the exam also, they do ask to calculate reorder time. So the formula for calculating reorder time is the order quantity divided by annual demand multiplied by 365. How often you need to place an order, you can calculate it by Q divided by B multiplied by 365. Got it? Now here is understanding number five students. How frequently will the company place an order? Look, they have not given us the formula, but they are asking, how frequently will the company place an order? How much inventory will it have on hand when the order is placed? So you are required to calculate reorder quantity and reorder level. Uh, reorder time and reorder level. So what is the formula for reorder time? Reorder time, what is the formula? Q divided by B multiplied by 365. And what about reorder level? It's the demand in lead time. 
demand in lead time. What is the lead time? A time lag between placing an order and order being delivered. So read the scenario using the data for W company. Okay, we have done the question for W company. We are asking about that. Assume that the company adopts a EOQ. I think that is the data for W company. Company adopts EOQ as its order quantity and that it now takes two weeks for an order to be delivered. How frequently will the order, will the company place an order? That is the data for W company. So what, what was the quantity, order quantity? EOQ was 3162. How much was the annual demand? 30,000? 30,000 30, was the annual demand. Multiply by 365, that will be the reorder time. How many days? Sorry? 38. 38. 38 days. Okay, now what is the demand and lead time? What is the lead time first you need to see? It now takes two weeks for an order to be delivered. So in weeks, they are telling that two weeks for an order to be delivered. How much lead time will be there? What is the demand? What is the annual demand? 30,000. This is for how many weeks? 52, there are 52 or 50 weeks we consider in a year, 52 weeks. And what is the lead time? How many weeks? Two weeks. This will be your pre-order level. 1154. 1154. 1154 units must be in the inventory at which time you must need to place an order. So how frequently after every 38 days? Got it? Now try the next question. How frequently will the company place an order? Okay, that is for D company, the one which you have, which you people have tried by yourself. What has been the annual demand for D company? 45,000? Okay, and what was the EOQ? 3721. 3721? Okay, now using this data, calculate. Sorry? Yes, 3721 divided by, divided by what? 45,000 is the demand. 30. Yeah, 30.4. 30.4. 30.4. 3721 divided by 45,000 multiplied by 365. 30 days. 30 days? 30 days. And reorder level, demand and the lead time? 45,000 was for? What is the lead time? Three weeks. Okay. Now, so 45,000 was annual for 52 weeks and multiply by lead time is three weeks. Two, five, nine, six. Two, five, nine, six units. Clear about the idea. This is how we are going to get it. Okay, now students reorder level with variable demand or variable lead time. Before to that, we have considered that. Sure, sure, sure. Go, go. Oh, sure. Asha, you must not have come to attend the class. Right. See yet your condition. What? Uh, no, no, I'm not getting moved to study at
Now I will be taking extra time for sure. And I will be giving homework as well for today. Extra time? No, today I'm very busy. You people are able to make the cash flow forecasts? Yeah, of course. Is it? So I will be giving you the homework regarding that, okay? Apart from that, we are going to do because cash flow for, for, forecasts take a lot of time to prepare. Variation part. Only that, sorry? Forecast variation part. Variation. No, variances. No, no. Not variances variation. are not. Not variances. Okay, I know the forecasts. Going now, cumulative forecast. Cumulative cash flow. No, no. Don't mix with that. Forecast. Okay, let's see here. Okay, now reorder re level with variable demand and variable lead time. We were discussing that when the lead time and demand is constant, we are going to use that ordinary formula that is uh, and that is demand in the lead time, where demand and lead time are constant. But in practical situations, they are not constant. But you will not be required to calculate the things in this scenario. When lead time and the uh, demand is variable, you will not be required to calculate the things, but you must be knowing that reorder level will be demand during lead time and demand and lead time are going to be variable in that case, okay? So they say when lead time and demand are known with certainty, reorder level is equal to demand during lead time where there is uncertainty and optimum level of buffer inventory must be found. This depends upon variability of demand cost of holding inventory and cost of stockouts. You will not be required to perform this calculation in the examination, but in multiple choice questions, they might ask you that when variable demand and variable lead time is there, then optimum level of buffer inventory must also be found. This can be asked. Now, my dear students, there are so many inventory management systems which are adopted in the organizations. And most specifically, period, periodic review, and just in time can be asked to you in the exam. Now, what is the periodic review? As its name is suggesting us that inventory is going to be counted after a specific interval. We are going to see that how much inventory is there, and we are going to fill up the inventory again in order to reach the predetermined level. We are going to set a predetermined level, and every now and forth, we are going to review the inventory which is present in our warehouse and we are going to make it reach the predetermined level. Whereas JIT is concerned, we do see that we do not have any inventory in our warehouse. So cost of holding becomes nil, but cost of ordering becomes high because just in time is a method in which we need to order only when the need is going to arise. Got it? Otherwise, we are not going to order. When the customer is going to give the order to us, at that specific time, we are going to give the order to our supplier. So let's read quickly what your book says about both these systems. They say, a number of systems have been developed to simplify the inventory management processes. Periodic review, just in time. Periodic review systems, constant order cycle system. In this, constant order cycle will be there. The reorder level and the reorder, reorder level can change, but the reorder quantity will be the same. Inventory levels are reviewed at fixed intervals, that is every four weeks. The inventory in hand is then made up to the predetermined level, which takes account of likely demand before the next review, likely demand during the lead time. So when you are going to make a periodic review, you are going to be concerned about the likely demand before the next review, how much demand is going to arise in the time period until the next review, and how much demand is going to arise in the lead time, how much demand is going to arise in the delivery time period. Thus, a four-weekly review in a system where the lead time was two weeks, the total review under consideration would be four plus two weeks for lead time. So they say would demand that inventory to be made up to likely maximum demand for next six weeks. Under this system, orders are evenly spread, so it is popular with suppliers. So periodic review is popular among suppliers, and just in time is also popular, but the thing is that in order to maintain operations with just in time can become a little bit challenging for the organizations. We need to have long-lasting contracts with our suppliers to take them in trust that we are not going to leave you. So whatever we are going to demand from you, you have to deliver it to us in time. So just in time systems, GIT series of manufacturing and supply chain techniques that aim to minimize inventory levels and improve customer service by manufacturing not only at the exact time customers require, 
but also in the exact quantities they need and at competitive prices. In GIT systems, the balancing act is dispensed with. Now, when we are using the just in time, dispense the, the balancing act between liquidity and profitability is dispensed. We are not following the balancing act between liquidity and profitability. Why? We are not focusing on profitability at all. We are more liquid because we are not ordering any inventory. So the balancing act is not followed in just in time. We are trying to be more liquid rather than profit profitable. So it is going to be dispensed. Inventory is reduced to an absolute minimum or eliminated altogether. So aims of just in time are smooth flow of work through the manufacturing plant, a flexible production process, which is responsive to the customer's requirements, reduction in capital tied up in inventory. This involves the elimination of all activities performed that do not add value, that is waste. Now students, practice questions are there. We have finished the chapter. We are asking when using this formula, that is economic order quantity, to find the optimal quantity to be ordered, which of the following amounts are not included in the calculations? So which amount is not going to be included? Even you are not reading the scenario, you can tell. Yes, yeah, so it's carrying cost value. So no, 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 it's holding. Yeah. That is holding cost. Carrying cost is holding cost. So this is included. Yeah. Last one. Where are we including purchase price? By the way. Purchase price per unit. Cost per order is there. Carrying cost is holding cost. Purchase price per unit we are not using in this formula. Estimate usage of inventory item over the particular period, that is demand. So these are all used instead of purchasing price per unit. So they have given this scenario anyhow without reading this scenario also. We do know that in this specific formula, we are not using purchasing price per unit. Okay, now the economic order quantity is a formula to calculate a realistic purchase price for an item. Is it? Is it the formula to calculate realistic no. purchase price? No. Determines the lowest order quantity by balancing the cost of ordering against the cost of holding inventory. So balancing cost of ordering. And yes. It tells us. Oh, yeah. Yes, it tells us about the balance between the holding and the ordering cost. Determines the lowest order quantity by balancing the cost of ordering against the cost of holding inventory is used to calculate how much safety inventory should be carried. No. Should be cal calculated once a year? No. So option B is the right one. Okay, now, which of the following statements is true? The reorder level is the measure of inventory at which a replenishment order should be made. Replenishment refill, you can say. So the reorder level is the measure of inventory at which a replenishment order should be made. Is it true? Yes, yes, it's true. What is the reorder level? How much quantity of inventory must be there when we have to refill, when we have to reorder? So yes, they are saying this. Sorry? Refill, you can say. Okay, refill. So refill order. Use, a reorder, use of the reorder level builds in a measure of safety inventory and minimizes the risk of organizations running out of inventory. Is this true? Oh. Safety inventory. So for safety inventory, we do yeah, maintain the reorder level to be safe so that we should not be running out of these stocks. So both the statements are true. Okay, now understanding number 10. Periodic review means ordering in inventory at a fixed and regular time interval. Is it? Yes. yes, this is true. So fortunately, the first statement is true. All the others are going to be wrong. Let's see. Ordering inventory when it falls below the designated safety inventory level. No, we have not discussed it. Ordering inventory in consultation with suppliers relative to their available capacity. No. Ordering inventory at a predetermined reorder level. No. We are going to do the periodic review and we have to make the replenishment order up to the amount of the inventory which is which is which needs to be refilled in our warehouse. 
Okay, now students, the next chapter, working capital management regarding accounts receivables and payables. Again, like all the other working capital items, for receivables also, we have to balance between liquidity and profitability. When we are going to have more receivables, it means that we are increasing our profitability. More receivables means that we are increasing our sales revenue and are not trying to receive the debts from the receivables. When we are not trying to receive the debts from the receivables, our sales revenue is going to increase, our credit sales are going to be increased, but our cash flow is going to be decreased. So we should not be increasing our receivables on the cost of liquidity because, as I've told you so many times, the debts have to be fulfilled using the cash, not using the profit. So they say the optimum level of trade credit extended represents a balance between two factors. Profit improvement from sales obtained by allowing credit, the cost of credit allowed. So what is liquidity? Collecting sales receipts as quickly as possible to reduce the cost of financing the receivable balance. And profitability, extending the credit period to customers to encourage additional sales. Remember this trade-off is the key factor in determining the company's working capital investment. Okay, now, students, whenever the organizations are trying to receive the amount back from the receivables, it means that they have to work on their credit policy. It means that they are trying to become more liquid. Am I right? When the organizations do try to work on their profitability, they do give extended credit limits. So the profitability is going to be increased. So they say management established a policy, a credit policy. For accounts receivables, the company's policy will be influenced by the demand for the products, competitors' items, risk of irrecoverable debts, financing costs, cost of credit control. When the organization will be thinking that whether the credit limits have to be increased for the receivables or not, it will be depending upon these given uh, factors. If the demand for the products is more, then even if the credit policy is going to be tightened, the demand is going to be affected to a lesser extent. If the competitor terms are very high, very strong terms are there from the competitor side. And even if you, you also are uh, limiting the credit limit, the demand of your products will be less certain. Profitability is going to be decreased. And risk of the recoverable debts and the cost when the recoverable debts are going to be higher. When you estimate that the recoverable debts are going to be higher, your credit limit is going to be then limited. You are going to pressurize on the credit limit. Financing costs. If the financing costs are high, then what do you want? The receivables should be lesser or the higher, and the cost of financing is high. Very good. So cost of credit control, if the cost of credit control is higher, then you are going to reduce the limits. A credit policy has four aspects. Whenever the credit policy is going to be made, it has four aspects. It will be dependent upon the credit worthiness of the, of the customer, how much worthy the customer is to pay back the debts. And the information regarding credit worthiness we can take from the bank, which is maybe difficult to have. And the banks do have a habit to give the, you know, the same types of formats to everyone. They do not leak the confidential data. So you can hire the factors, uh, you know, from outside the market. There are some persons who are giving the services to assess the credit worthiness. So anyhow, how efficient the person is to pay back the debts is, is assessing credit worthiness, credit limits. How much credit limits are present for the specific person from the statement of accounts? We are going to see invoice promptly and collect overdue debts. We have to read the statement of accounts carefully and we have to invoice in a prompt manner. We should not be delaying and we need to collect overdue debts and monitor the credit systems. We need to keep in mind that when the debts are going to be overdue, their chances of collection do becomes lesser. Now, cost of financing receivables. Obviously, we do know that there is a finance cost related to the receivables. What is the finance cost? Receivables balance multiplied by interest rate. That is the finance cost simply. So receivables balance, how do we calculate as we have seen in the working capital investment scenario as well? Receivable days multiply the credit sales divided by 365. So here is the question, calculate the receivable days for pass claim, calculate the annual cost of financing receivables. 
Uh, it seems to be very straightforward question. Fastlane company has sales of 20 million dollars for the previous year. Receivables at the year and put 4 million in the cost of financing receivables is covered by an overdraft at the interest rate of 12%. So we are required to calculate the receivables balance. What is the formula? Oh, sorry, we are required to calculate receivables days. Receivable GSEC requirement. So what is the formula? Receivables, how much receivables are there? 4 million divided by how much credit sales are there? 20 million multiplied by 365 will be the receivable days. 73 days. Okay, then they are asking about cost of finance and receivables. So simply receivables balance, that is how much? 4 million multiplied by interest rate. Interest rate is 12%. So 0 0.48, 0 0.48 million dollars, okay? So this is our cost of financing receivables, which is simply receivables balance multiplied by finance cost as they have written. Clear? Okay, now early settlement discounts. Sometimes there are cash discounts given. Do you remember in financial accounting, maybe you have uh, heard this term, cash discounts or trade discounts or settlement discount. Cash discounts are also known as settlement discounts. Whenever we do want to attract the customers to make them give the debt back to the company earlier, as early as possible, we do introduce them the settlement discounts. Say, for example, uh, hardship purchases something from me, and he says that, ma'am, I'm going to pay you after three months. So after one month only, he comes back to me and he says that, ma'am, I have promised for three months, but now I'm paying you after one month, but please give me some discount because of that. The discount which I will be giving to him will be known as a settlement discount. Now, whenever the settlement discount is going to be given, receivables are going to be lesser. So in order to improve liquidity, we do introduce the settlement discounts as well. Now, there is the cost of discount also. When we are giving the cash discount, when we are giving the settlement discount, there is certain cost for that. That is known as annual cost of discount. With the help of the formula, we can calculate it in this manner. One plus discount divided by, this is basically amount left to pay. In the book, it is written as wrong. It is amount left to pay. Okay, so this is L-E-F-T, okay? Discount divided by amount left to pay, raised to the power which is going to be number of periods what is number of periods say for example if it is in days take 365 if it is in weeks 52 or if it is in uh months take 12 divided by number of days weeks or months earlier the money is received say for example the credit limit has been three months but the person is paying in one month so the amount, number of days earlier the money is received is now two months. Two months earlier the person is paying. So this is how we are going to calculate the number of periods and minus one. So this is the annual cost of discount. Now, if the annual cost of discount, if this annual cost of discount is lesser than, is lesser than the interest rate or the finance cost, then we should be going for the discount. We should be seeing that we can we can make the discount possible for the receivables. Otherwise, not okay. And when we have to pay, when we have to pay the payables, then opposite. If the annual cost of discount for payables, if we have to avail the discount, if this annual cost of the discount is then higher than the interest cost, then we are going to avail the discount. Okay. So what they say, cash discounts are given to encourage early payments by customers. The cost of the discount is balanced against the savings of the company received from having less capital tied up due to the lower receivables balance and shorter average collection period. Discounts may also reduce the number of irrecoverable debts. The calculation of the annual cost can be expressed as the formula. Notice that the annual cost collect calculation is always based on the amount left to pay. That is the amount net of discount. 
If the cost of offering the discount exceeds the rate of overdraft interest, then discount should not be offered. So they are writing, if the cost of offering the discount exceeds the rate of overdraft interest, then the discount should not be offered. So when the discount has to be offered, if the annual cost of the discount is lesser than the interest rate. If it's more, then the discount should not be offered. Got it? Clear up to here? Are you clear about the formula as well? Okay, now here is understanding number two. What is the effective annualized cost of offering the discount and should it be offered if the bank would low on the company at 18%? So interest rate is 18%. So the discount should be offered only if the annualized cost is lesser than this, otherwise not. Okay, so you have to calculate the cost of discount. What is the formula? One plus discount divided by amount left to pay raised to the power number of periods which is which is n but no but how do we calculate number of periods 60 by days divided by yes number of days number of total days weeks or divided by the number of time period earlier of than that which we are paying Okay, so the minus one. Okay, minus one is not from the of periods. Okay, minus one is separate. Okay, now the company is offering a cash discount of 2.5% to receivables if they agree to pay the debts within one month. The usual credit period taken is three months. Okay, so one plus discount is how much? 2.5%. Divided by amount left to pay, 2.5% discount will be given, the amount left to pay will be 97.5. Got it? Sometimes an amount that you can use because over here the amount is not given, that is why. This is that is wow. Sorry? You have to make a single credit more than you are not hundred. Yes, if, if you are taking in percentage, both the things are fine. Then take 0 0.025, 0 0.975 and take it. Okay, now the number of periods. So the number of time period they have given in months. So 12 divided by how many months earlier the transaction is now going to be made. The credit policy is for three months and the person is agreed to pay in one month. So earlier two months. Two months earlier the person is now agreed to pay. So 12 divided by two minus one. So it will become six. So how much it is? Five, five. five, all the answer? Sure. The difference is quite high from 18% to 5.15. Zero point one six four. That seems to be correct because the difference is lesser. So it's sixteen point four percent. Five point the difference is quite high. So anyhow, sixteen point four. It is the cost is lesser than the interest. That is why except it means that we should be offering the discount. Got it? Okay, now, sometimes we do use the concept of invoice discounting and factoring. What happens? Sometimes the organization do outsource the responsibility for collecting the debts. Instead of collecting the debts by themselves in order to save time and cost, they do outsource this responsibility to the third parties. This responsibility can be outsourced in the case of invoice discounting and factoring. Okay, what are these? Invoice discounting and factoring are both ways of speeding up the receipt of the funds from accounts receivable. Invoice discounting. Invoice discounting is a method of raising finance against the security of receivables without using the sales ledger administration service of factor. So in invoice discounting, we do 
raise the finance against the security of the receivables. What we do? We do tell the person, the discounter, that this much amount of receivables balance we do have in our account. Against this, take it as a security like we do give the other assets. Do take it as a security and give us the amount. So this is the discounting procedure. Do you remember about bills receivable? Maybe you have discussed sometime. When we do discount bills receivable as well, we do give the bill receivable as the security and against that we receive an amount. So Atif, we were discussing the concept of invoice discounting. Invoice discounting is going to be used when we are in hurry and we have to get the amount of receivables as quickly as possible. So receivables are going to pay once the credit limit is going to reach. So we go to the discounter and we do request that person that please take the receivables balance as the security and against that, please give us the amount. So that is known as an invoice discounting. So which procedure is followed? Company, customer, and invoice discounter is there. Company goes to the invoice discounter and requests and borrow the money. Sometimes some percentage of the receivables balance will be given. Obviously, even the discounter will not be giving all the amount. Otherwise, they may lose the amount of money. So the discounter will be giving the amount to the company before to the time period. Then the customer returns the amount to the customer and the company gives it to the discounter. So what this is, company, the company sells goods to the customer payable in 30 days. Then two, the company borrows up to 80% of the value of debt, up to the 80% of the value of this amount the company can receive from the invoice discounter. The invoice discounter, uh, then the customer, the company receives the payment from the customer. And then the company pays the invoice discount or the amount borrowed plus interest. After receiving the amount from the customer, the company pays the amount of discount, discount and interest. Sorry? Okay, sure. Okay, anyhow. They want to start with something different and then we will enter it on the Okay, anyhow. Factoring. So in voice discounting, we have understood, but in factoring, what is going to happen? We are going to outsource the process wholly, okay? So instead of taking the discounted amount from the person, from the discounter, in factoring, we are completely going to outsource the responsibility that is to the person which is known as factor. So what is going to happen? Factoring is outsourcing of the credit control department to the third party. In the case of invoice discounting, we are not giving the control to the third party. We are taking the discounted amount, then the customer is paying to the company and then company itself together with the amount of interest, it is paying to the discounter. But in the case of factoring, we are giving the control to the third party. Okay, so the control is going to be with the third party. Factoring is the outsourcing of the credit control department to a third party. The debts of the company are effectively sold to a factor, normally owned by a bank. The factor takes on the responsibility of collecting the debt for a fee. The company can choose some or all of the following three services offered by the factor. Debt collection and administration, recourse or non-recourse. Now, my dear students, debt collection and administration can be recourse or non-recourse. What is the difference we are going to study? Financing, credit, insurance. So the responsibilities which can be provided to us by the factor can be regarding debt collection and administration, regarding to give us finance or the credit insurance. These are of particular value to smaller firms and faster growing firms. Okay, now, when the administration and debt collection is going to be given to the third party, the process is going to be like this. When including finance and the service is going to be given, then the process will be like this. So let's see. When administration and debt collection responsibility is given to the factor, what is going to be the course? So company, company is going to sell the goods to the customer payable in 30 days. In the second step, the company sells the debts to the factor. Then the customer pays the factor after 30 days. In this case, the customer will not be paying to the company, 
but to the factor itself. And then the factor pays the, pays the company less any administration fee. So this is when the administration and debt collection is going to be outsourced to the third party. Together with admin and debt collection, when the financing is also included, what happens then? Company in an ordinary way sells goods to the customers to be payable in 30 days. Then the company sells the debt to the factors again. The third step, up to 80% of the debt is paid to the company in advance, but remaining 20% is gold. And what is going to happen? The customer pays the factor after 30 days. And number four, what is going to happen? Yes, the customer pays the factor after 30 days and the factor pays the company the balance less administration fee and finance. So this is the normal difference. Okay, now understanding number four is there. This is very, uh, what we can say, common sense understanding. We have not discussed any of the formula regarding factoring arrangement, but this is the example which is involving only common sense. So we have to see that how much cost we are going to bear and how much benefit we are going to bear, we are going to have when we are having the factor in action. So part A of the requirement, determine the rel relative costs and benefits of using the factor in each of the following scenarios. The factor will operate on the service only basis, administering and collecting payment from agents customers. This is expected to generate administrative savings of 100,000 each year. So the first saving, first benefit, which is in front of us is administrative savings. How much? $100,000. The factor has undertaken to pay outstanding debts after 45 days regardless of whether the customer has actually paid or not. Whether the customer has paid or not, but the factor is going to pay to the company within 45 days. The factor will make a service charge of 1.7% of Aaron's revenue. So the cost, first cost will be 1.75% of Aaron's revenue. We are going to see in the scenario how much is this. Then Aaron can borrow at an interest rate of 8% per hour. So my dear students, the cost of finance, which is going to be saved by taking the uh, receivables balance earlier will be how much? 8% of the receivables balance. So let's see the scenario now. Aden is a medium-sized company producing a range of engineering products, which it sells to wholesale distributors. Recently, its sales have begun to rise rapidly due to the economic recovery. However, it is concerned about its liquidity position and is looking at ways of improving cash flows. Its sales are 16 million per annum and the average receivables are 3.3 million, representing about 75 days of sales. So my dear students, the cost of finance will be on receivables balance, 3.3. 3 million and the cost, this cost, uh, that was the interest fee which we have to give to the factor, 1.7% of 3.3 million. Am I right? How many days earlier the amount is being received? The normal is 75 days of sale, but the amount is going to be received how many days earlier? 30 days, 30 days earlier it is going to be received. So according to that, we are going to calculate the benefits and costs. So isn't it the general one, the common sense question that we are going to compare the costs and benefits and we are going to see the net benefit we are having. If, if the benefit is there, then we should be going for. If no, then we should not be going for. So no formula is there. This is just the common sense question and an exam. It cannot come as the long question like investment appraisal. Maybe in the multiple choice question or together with the large scenario, they can give you this type of question to comment on. Got it? So this is what you can do by your own help as well. Now, they are telling in the second case, it is now considering a factoring arrangement with a different factor where 80% of the book value of invoices is paid immediately with finance cost charged on advance of that 10%. 
So when 80% of the book value is going to be paid immediately, it means that the cost of finance is now going to be saved, reduced, yes. Suppose that this sector will charge 1% of the sales as safety. Managing the sales ledger and there will be administrating savings of 100,000 as before, but that the outstanding balance will be paid after 75 days. There is no change in the typical payment pattern by customers this time. Can you start doing this by yourself? Make one column for the cost and the other for benefits. When you are done with this part, tell me I will scroll to the other page. So one benefit which is very straightforward here is administration savings. Like the previous scenario, how much are these? 100,000, this is very straightforward. And then finance cost charged on advance of 10%. This will be the saving for us? Cost. So 10% on the 80%. Finance cost will be there, 80% of the book value. <laughs> 264, is this the net benefit? Cost. Okay, okay, then the next one. Cost of uh, financing is to education. Cost of financing is 80% of the book value. Yes, book value you see from here. Sorry, are you asking something? Yes, please ask. Please ask. 80% of the book value. The book value is 3.3. Yes. How much? Okay, in cost, what we but you have taken? Uh, have you taken this one percent? One percent of six million. One percent of sales that is sixteen million. Sixteen million for sales. Yeah. Is it? Okay, this one you have taken. Then administration savings. Administration savings we have written. How much is it? Hundred thousand. Hundred thousand admin. Yes, oh. straightforward. Okay, then uh, for this one, uh, the finance costs. Two hundred and sixty-four thousand. Two hundred and sixty-four. Where did you wrote this? Uh, in the cost. In the cost. Okay, how much it is? Two hundred sixty-four. Two sixty-four dollars. Yeah, I'm sorry. 200 and how did you calculate it? 80% of 3.3 book value, yes. 10% of that. Into 10%, very good. So how did you get, how much did you get? 260. 4,000, very good. Okay, then. That is order. Yes, overdraft is also there. Uh, 70, 20%. Where is the information regarding that? I am missing it. 1%. Oh, 10%. Okay, 1%. We have taken. 8%, right? No, 8%, but this will finance uh, uh, the balance amount. 
that would be very risky because if we are following just in time principle we need the inventory in the time of urgency and if we are not paying our payables in time they can refuse to supply us credit credit is normally seen as the free source of finance while this is normally true it may be that the supplier offers a discount for early payment in this case delaying payment is no longer free since the cost will be the lost discount in examination you need to be able to calculate the cost of this discount for bond it can be done using the same techniques we saw under accounts receivable so now in this case if the annual discount cost if annual 
discount cost or uh, equivalent discounted discounting cost is more than the rate of interest. then we should be availing the discount, otherwise not. So this is contrary to the previous principle. Now understanding number five is there. One supplier has offered a discount to box company of 2% on an invoice for 7,500. If payment is made within one month rather than three months normally taken to pay. If box overdraft rate is 10% per annum, is it financially worthwhile for them to accept the discount and pay early? No. So how do you know? We have not calculated. No, we have only rate of interest given. We have not calculated the annual discount value yet. We have to calculate and then we are going to compare. I was astonished that before to calculation, how did you establish? Okay, so the same formula we are going to use. How, what was that? One over discount divided by amount left to pay, raised to the power of number of periods, divide minus one. Same formula you are going to use. So one plus discounted amount is, invoice is 7,500, discount is 2%. How much it is? 2% of 7,500? 150. 150. 150? Yeah. Divided by amount left to pay will be how much? 7500 minus 150? 7350. 7350. Now, number of period, rather than three months, it is taking one month only. 12 by two. So, 12 divided by 2 minus 1. This will be the discounted value. Annual discount, how much? Uh, 12.8%. 12.8%. So it is. Okay. Is it? So if it is more than the rate of interest, so it should we uh, accept the discount? Yeah, we should. Yes, we I need to accept it. the discount. You didn't get it? Because when we discussed this last point in our previous example, you were out. When we are thinking that to receivables, we have to give a discount or is your calculation all right? Did you get the same answer? You didn't get the same? I don't, I don't yes, in this previous question also, you were getting the wrong. No. Let me just get it. Okay, then Hasha. In the previous question, you did mistake was. 150. So I get one more minus one. So I get one. Got it. In the previous example, you did the same mistake. This is the one point zero two level. This is the Got it. Okay, now because in this case we are thinking that we need to pay early or should we avail the discount or not. If the annual cost of discount is more than the rate of interest you are going to accept. If we are receivables, in the case of receivables, if we are thinking that whether we should be offering the discount or not, 
Then we have to see that if the annual cost of the discount is lesser than the rate of interest, then we are going to offer the discount, okay? Now try the next understanding. Equivalent annual cost of discount. You do not need to compare anything, just calculate the annual discount. And you are assuming that there are 50 weeks in a year instead of 52. Yes. Or even if you are not using 100, just you can take in the percentages as well. The sound is 1.75%. So the remaining uh, 90, 98.25. 98.25 is the amount left to pay. In both the ways you can do. In the case of weeks, how will divide them? In the case of percentage? Weeks. Sorry? Weeks are here. 50 weeks are here. Yes, 50 weeks are here. So, number of periods we are going to calculate over here. Yeah. So, 50 Five. weeks Five. divided by within Five. 8 weeks, uh, 3 50. and 8, 5. Five. Yes. 50 divided by 5. Eight. Uh, Atif, we are going to receive, we are going to pay within three weeks. But the normal time period is eight weeks. So how much earlier we are paying? Five weeks. Okay, this, this way happens. Nineteen point three percent. Correct. Maybe, maybe if you are going to get the same answer, then it's correct. The formula will be 1 plus 1.75 divided by 98.25, 50 divided by 5 minus 1. How much? Oh, 97. 9.7. 9.7? Is it Hashim? Oh, I got 1.193 minus 1, that is 9.3. Just a moment. Get the I think that now this time his answer is correct because 99 or 97 percent is very high for the answer. 99. I told 19. 19. Even his answer is 19 something. 9 something? Nine zero. Your was 90. Then it's wrong. Happen. 90 can't be. But the calculation is from not much options. Yes, maybe. maybe the is, yeah. Actually, my, my calculator is the simple one. Huh? So I cannot take the power or until, until it is there. Yes, power is not there. Yeah. One point seven point zero zero point eight point zero 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 after the city option, we will be in the option. Okay, there is a bit of formula difference. Okay, might be that. That is why. Now, okay. now students, here is a theory portion over here only. This is about managing foreign trade. This is only for theory. Practical numericals are not there. Overseas accounts receivables and payables bring additional risks that need to be managed. When we are 
uh, dealing with the overseas receivables or payables, there can be additional risks. And those are related to the export credit risk and foreign exchange risk. Export credit risk is that because the person outside the country, maybe he or she is not going to pay us. Foreign exchange risk is the rate of exchange between our currency and the other country's uh, currency. So export credit risk is the risk of failure or delay in collecting payments due to due from foreign customers. Foreign exchange risk is the risk that the value of currency will change between the date of contract and the date of settlement for details see chapter 13. In chapter 13, we have these questions in detail. Yes, foreign currency is there in our uh, syllabus in cost of capital and everything we are going to discuss. So practice questions are there. Okay. In order to improve operational cash flows, indicate whether a company would need to increase or decrease their receivables balance and payables balance. Decrease your receivables in order to improve the operational cash flows. What we have to do? In order to improve operational cash flows. What do you think, Adif? If we are going to decrease the receivables, are our cash flows going to be good ones? Yeah, it will be good, right? It will be liquid. liquid. And what about the payables? If we are going to decrease the payables? Yeah. Sorry? Increase the payable, decrease the receivables. Decrease the receivables. Yes. So which option is the right one? C, B. No, not C. Sorry, it's option. Or D, 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 D. D. Okay. Uh, understanding number eight. What is the effective annualized cost of the discount if LFE PLC does settle within one month? Do you want to calculate it once again? Do you want to try it once again? Again, the same formula you have to apply. Okay. Okay, now understanding number nine. The main aspects of debt factoring include administration of the client's invoicing, sales accounting, and debt collection service. Is this? The main aspects of debt factoring includes administration of client's invoicing, sales accounting, and debt collection service. Sales accounting is not involved. Okay. But the managing uh, client's invoicing. Debt collection service is involved. Okay. Making payments to the client in advance of collecting the debts? Is this yes? Credit protection when the service is non recourse? Yes. Credit protection is going to be given when the service is non recourse. Okay. So option two and three are the correct ones. The students, we have finished this chapter as well. You can do the remaining two understandings by yourself. Okay, now. Working capital management, it is having a lot of theory in it. A lot of theory is there. And we do have then cash flow forecasts in it. Can I just request you to read this chapter by yourself? And we are going to go through this chapter summarized in a summarized way in our next class. Is it fine for you? Just read this question. In working capital, my dear students, theory is very important. Whenever the question from the working capital portion does come, the theory is involved there, okay? So do make sure that you are treating that. So with this, we are finishing our lecture for today. If you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. And here are your tests. And you honestly, please try to perform it. Also, I'm not doing the revision here. That's why I'm a little bit afraid that you should be able to do it, but you are not revising it. <laughs> Yes, investment appraisal. In investment appraisal, we do have NPV, and you are not revising then. Sorry. Not